Hello, everybody. I'd like to thank everybody who came out tonight and all the visitors that we have here. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming to worship and learn about God's Word. If there's anything that's done or said here that you don't understand or disagree with, please come talk to me or one of the elders after services, and we'd be happy to help you and have a study with you. Um, tonight, I'd like to talk about God's authority and what that is, what that means, why we need to understand that, and why we need to follow God's authority, why we need to follow His Word, and then how we can apply that to our lives and how we can use that in our lives. So, first of all, I'd like to start with understanding the word authority itself. The word comes from the Latin root octor, meaning originer or creator, and it's defined as, in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the power or influence to command thought, opinion, or behavior. Some examples of that are the government has authority over our society today. They have the ability to command our behavior and how we act in society because of their laws. And the same idea with the parent over the child has the ability to influence their thought, opinion, and behavior and command those things from them. So now that we understand what that is, let's start off with why do we need God's authority? What makes that important? Well, the first point I'd like to bring up is that God is our creator. If you look with me in Psalms chapter 100 and verse 3, we'll begin there. Psalms chapter 100 and verse 3. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. So see, here we see the psalmist is saying that God created us. He's our creator and He gives us everything and we belong to Him and are His. We're His people, we don't belong to ourselves, nobody else. We are His and should follow His authority. If you look in John starting in chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. Verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So we see here John talking about the word that we see is Jesus. And it's saying that in the beginning he was with God, and God created everything through him. Everything was made by God through Jesus. And this is, again, reinforcing the point that he is our creator. That's part of the reason why we're under his authority, because he created us. We belong to him, as we saw in Psalms. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 and verse 15. Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So in this chapter, Paul and Barnabas are traveling and preaching the word to others, and on this occasion, they... There are other people in the city who believe that they are gods, believe that Paul and Barnabas are gods who have come down. And Paul, in this verse, as we see, is correcting them and saying, we're not God, we're not gods, we're just men. And these gods that you preach and worship are vain, as he says, and you should turn from them and worship God and follow his authority. Not man's, not another gods that you've made up, but the true living God, you need to follow his authority and what he says. If you look later in that book, in chapter 17, in verse 24, Acts 17 and verse 24. The God, who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. So again, this is Paul preaching to brethren in, or people, rather, in Athens, out of the Greeks there. After he had looked at all their gods and the temples that he had made, he said, there's only one God, and you need to turn to worship him, and he doesn't need any of these things that you've made for he doesn't need anything that you can made because he's created you and he made you. He can't possibly need anything from you because you should be following him, not him requiring something from you. The next point I'd like to look at is we find our fulfillment by obeying him. It's not, we, that's part of the reason why we obey him. If you look with me in Colossians 3.17, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, 
giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we need to be giving thanks to God because, as we talked about earlier, he's our creator, and we should be doing everything through him and by him and everything in his name, falling under his authority. If you look with me in Psalms 119, Psalms 119, verses 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes in your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. So here we see it's not something that we should just be doing because we have to be doing. We should be doing it with a joyful heart, delight in doing these things as the psalmist is teaching here. This is something we should love doing, constantly meditating and focusing on these things and not just doing it because we have to. If you look in Ecclesiastes in verse 12 through 13, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13, this is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So here we see the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, this is what we have been created to do. This is what God created us for. This is what we've been made to do. This is what we should find our fulfillment in. And as we saw in Psalms, what we should delight in. This is something that we shouldn't just be doing because we have to, but because this is what our purpose is and this is our fulfillment and what we should find joy in. I'd also like to look at the fact that the, of what happens when you when you do what he says and don't do what he says. If you look in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his, invi for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature, rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So you see here in Romans, Paul is writing, and he's saying that these are people who the wrath of God will be brought on them because of their unrighteousness and because of how they suppress the truth. God showed them his power. He, they knew that there was a higher power than themselves, and still they didn't do what he had told them to. They didn't do what he wanted them to. So he gave them up to what they wanted to do. He let them follow after their lusts and passions, as we see later in the reading. Um, if you'll turn to Matthew 25 with me, I will see some direct consequences of when you continue to follow and God gives you up to those things you want to do. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this is what happens to people who obey him and do what he wants. We receive the eternal kingdom. But if you look later in verse 41, then he will say to, me, well, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And down in verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So this is what happens when we do his authority. We receive good things and get to enter into his eternal glory. But when we don't do what he says, as we saw in Romans chapter 1, and when we keep following or keep turning away from him and don't do what he asks, he, we receive this punishment, um, eternal death. And if you'll look in Revelations chapter 21 with me, Revelations chapter 21, verses 7 through 8.
The one who conquers will have his heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So we see in the first part, of the first part in verse 7, that's what happens when you follow his word. He gives you his heritage, and you get to be a son and enter into that eternal life. But on the other hand, when you don't do what he says, when you keep following what you want to do instead of what he says, in verse 8 we see you'll be cast into the lake of eternal fire and brimstone. And that's the eternal death that he was talking about over in Matthew 25. We see in Jeremiah 10, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, that we should live our lives according to God's authority, and we should submit it to him. Jeremiah, we should live under his authority. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. So, again, we see here the idea that we're not following after, our, we should not be following after our own hearts, what we want to do. It's not in ourselves. It, we should be following to God's word and looking to what he says for our direction and our steps. So that way to be why we need God's authority. How do we know if the things we're doing are authorized? How do we know if those follow after God's authority in his path? And I think the answer to that is by reading his word. And if we look in Psalms 119, 105, we'll see that there. Psalms chapter 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So this here is saying his word is what should be directing us. It, it's the light to our path as we walk along, along life. And this is what should be directing us in our steps. If you look to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So all scripture comes from God, and as we see in we saw in Psalms, this is what should be leading us. It all comes from God, and this is what we should be using to correct each other and look to and learn from his word, and this is what the man of God should be equipped for, and use it to equip for every good work. So this is our complete authoritative guide. This is We don't need anything else. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. So his word, and this is talking specifically about the law of Moses, but the principle still holds true that we shouldn't be adding or taking away to his word. We don't need to be changing anything that he says because it's our complete word and there's no change needed to be made. If you look in Jude verse 3, in the book of Jude in verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So we see here, as Jude is writing, that this was what was once for all delivered. There's no second delivery. There will be nothing else that's delivered. This, his word was delivered once, and it's the only thing that we need. It was delivered once for all. When we create our own traditions, we try to supersede what God writes, we're violating his authority, as we see in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 6, going through verse 8. And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. So as Jesus is saying here, these, pro these Pharisees and the people who were supposed to be holy were not doing what God had asked them to. They were creating their own traditions, 
and holding to their traditions as the doctrines that they should be following. And God, Jesus says here, it's in the worship that they do with these traditions are in vain. It doesn't matter. They're worshiping me in vain because they leave the commandments of God and don't do what he asks and instead try and uproot them with their own teachings. If we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor one against another. So we see here Paul is writing, we don't need to go beyond God's word. We're not supposed to go beyond God's word because as we saw when we do that, when we go beyond it, we're violating what he has asked us to do. If you look in Revelations chapter 22, Revelations 22, verses 18 through 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of the, this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. So again, we see... When we try to change God's word, when we make an addition or take from it, this is what happens. This is the punishments we receive because we're not supposed to be taking our own things and replacing God's word with them. So now that we've looked at these two things and we've looked about what it means and how we get that authority, how can we apply that scriptural authority to our lives? And I have three different areas that I'd like to look at, starting with our personal lives. How does this apply to us? And there are many people today who believe in the uh, practice of praying to Mary and asking her for, for to intercede on our part for Jesus. And I think that we need to look through that in Scripture. If you'll look in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19. Isaiah chapter 8, starting in verse 19. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chip and murmur, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? So here we see God's word saying, they shouldn't be, we shouldn't be praying to people who are dead. We shouldn't be inquiring of necromancers. We need to be praying directly to God and not through somebody who's already dead. Um, if you look with me in Luke 11, Luke chapter 11. Verses 27 through 28. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nurse. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So here we see that even if we were supposed to pray to people who have already passed, they, Mary wouldn't necessarily have any special influence over him. We see... Jesus is saying here, not necessarily that Mary wasn't hearing the word of God and keeping it, but that even if she was, nobody has special authority, nobody has special influence with him, and we should be, we're all equal in his eyes, we're all hearing the word of God, those who are keep hearing the word of God and keeping it. We need to be praying directly to God and not somebody else. Another area that I'd like to look at is what we should be filling our thoughts with and what we should be keeping our mind, or keeping in our mind. And if you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, we'll look there. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is, anything, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So here we see the writer is saying, these are, this is what we should be filling our thoughts with, things that are commendable, worthy of praise, and everything that he says and lists here. If we look in Matthew chapter 5, we see an example of what we shouldn't be thinking about and things that we should keep our minds away from. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 27 through 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who is holy, 
or everyone who looks at woman with a lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So this is Jesus saying, this is not what we should be doing. We need to be keeping our minds on other things, as we saw in Philippians, and that's what we need to be filling our mind with, and not these evil things that Jesus says here. So another area of our lives that I'd like to look at is our relationships, and relationships that we have with our friends, family, and people in our lives. If we look in chapter 5, starting in verse 21, we'll look at um, uh, focusing on loving and not hating others. Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 24. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and remember there that your brother has something against you, leave your gifts there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So here Jesus is saying, we should not be holding grudges. We shouldn't be angry. We shouldn't be keeping these hateful thoughts against our brothers and friends and family and things like this. And it's so important that he even says, if you brought something to sacrifice, you need to leave that there and go focus on keeping your relationship with your brother and keeping on good terms with them and not focusing on grudges and hating them. We need to be loving each other and brotherly love. Another thing that I'd like to look at is divorce. And unfortunately, it's quite a common practice today that divorce is widely accepted. But I think if we look in the Bible, we'll see on the contrary that it should not be. If you look in Malachi with me, Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16. Malachi 2, 16. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in spirit and do not be faithless. So here we see the writer who inspired of God from God's word saying that he, it's not good to be divorcing our spouse. It's not loving and when we do it we cover our garments with violence as the writer says here. If you look back, back with me in Matthew 19, Matthew chapter 19 and verses 3 through 9. Look at a, another example from, of that. Matthew chapter 19, starting at verse 3, going through verse 9. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made the male and female? And said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to one wife, so, and they shall become one flesh. So there are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They, they said to him, when, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for the cause of sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So here we see the idea again that Jesus is saying it's not a good thing to be divorcing our wives. We should be loving. And there's only one reason which he states is sexual immorality, being unfaithful, unfaithful to your spouse, that is acceptable for divorce. But you shouldn't be doing that in the first place. Other than that, he says it's not okay to divorce. He, he, God does not approve of it, and we're not authorized to do it. Another thing that's unfortunately um, very common in our society and prevalent is the idea that we should be accepting of people who practice homosexuality and accepting of these things. If you'll look in Romans chapter 1 with me, Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 26, going through 28. Romans 1, 26 through 28. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their woman exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And, and, the, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves the due penalty for their error. So as we, we looked at this chapter earlier, and it was saying that these people 
had known that there was a higher power and it had been revealed to them, but they still wanted to do it. So God gave them up to these things. And we see here the dishonorable passions that women are with women and men are with men. This is not something that God, God approves of as Paul is writing. This is not something that they should be doing, but they continue to do it. And we see here it's not acceptable and it's not something that we should be doing. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 6, and that should be 9 through 11, sorry. Or do you not know that the, unrighteousness, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. So we saw here, in, later in verse 9, men who practice homosexuality, and then later in verse 10, those people who did all these things in that list, including homosexuality, would not receive the kingdom of God. They'd receive the punishment that we talked about earlier, which is eternal death in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is hell. So another area I'd like to look at in our lives, we've looked at our personal lives and our relationship with others, but I'd also like to look at how we should be using authority in the church and how we should be uh, conducting worship in, among our brethren. So I'd like to look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 and looking at how we worship God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So this is giving us an example of what we should do and what we should be worshiping by and how we should be singing songs to one another and praising him with our mouth and our lips and singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And a, bun a bunch of people today think that it's acceptable to, and it's okay with God, that we worship with uh, mechanical instruments and things such. But I think, as we saw earlier, and you might be saying, it doesn't say here that we shouldn't be, and you're right, but it also, as we looked earlier, we saw that we should not be going beyond the things that are written, and I believe that's going beyond what's written here, that we should be worshiping, singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another. We'll look in another place in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, and we'll see the same thing here. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And so here again we see the idea that we saw back in Colossians is the idea that we should be addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to one another, and doing these things apart from mechanical instruments. Another thing I'd like to look at is Acts 20 and verse 7, and another way that we should worship God, and another, another idea of how our worship can be, should be conducted. In Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So here we get the idea that this is where we get our authority from gathering on the first day of the week, as the apostles did in Acts, as we see here. Gathering together to break bread, which is taking the Lord's Supper, which we also did earlier this morning, and Lord willing, we'll do later tonight. And he was preaching to them, as I'm doing now. So this is where we get the authority for other things, for things that we have done throughout our worship, which is singing, taking the Lord's Supper, gathering on the first day of the week, and me preaching right now. So these are all things that we should be doing as we worship God. Another area that I'd like to look at is the discipline of our church members and the discipline of brethren who fall away, unfortunately. Uh, looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, First Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not even tolerated among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For although absent in body, I am present in spirit, and, if, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, 
you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that he by his spirit or that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. So here we see that this brethren was unfortunately having sex with his father's wife, and this is something that Paul said is not even uh, acceptable among the Gentiles and the pagans who don't worship God. And these people were evidently just ignoring it and acting like it wasn't happening. They evidently knew that it was happening, but they were completely ignoring it, ignoring it and not doing anything about it. And Paul says, this is not something that you should be doing. You should be mourning and removing him from among you and unfortunately putting him away until he repents as we'll see later to, for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit can be saved when the Lord comes back. And that's the idea that we see here. And that's what we should be doing to brethren who fall away. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse, verses 7 through 11, we'll see what happens when those brethren who fall away come back. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. So you should rather turn to forgive him and comfort him, or he may be well overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him, for this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed what I, indeed what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted, uh, outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So Paul here is evidently talking about the brother who he had said earlier in 1 Corinthians and who had fallen away, and he's showing here what should happen when they come back and when they're repentant and they turn from those things that he was doing and evidently he had and Paul was saying you should accept him back and comfort him and forgive him so he's not overwhelmed by sorrow and um, so that they're not outwitted by Satan and so that he truly does leave permanently and this is the idea that we that Paul gives us here so tonight we've looked at what authority means and we saw that we should submit to God's authority because he's our creator it should be what we love to do because he gave it to us and this is what we should have delight in. We also see that his word is our guide. We should be looking at, to it for every matter, not just what we want to. And this is what we should be using all the time. And there's nothing else that's going to come after. We have to use this, in every guide, we have to use this guide for everything we do in every area of life as we looked at in the different ways that we apply it. So now I'd like to talk about God's authorized plan for salvation and how we, how we are saved and how we can be saved by God's authority. Because there are some people who believe that we can be saved by saying a prayer or just simply believing, but I think God's word shows us what we should be doing. So as we see in Romans, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. This is the first thing that we should be doing and this is the first thing that we have to do is hear God's word. Next, as we see in Acts 16 and verse 31, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your household. This is the next step that we have to do after we've heard the Lord. We have to believe in Jesus and believe him. Next, we have to repent as we see in Acts 17 and verse 30. We have to repent of our sins. And as we see, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So after we've heard the word and after we believed it and believe Jesus, we have to repent of our sins and turn from them. After that, we have to confess, confess God, confess that Jesus is our Lord, we see in, as we see in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this is the next step. We heard, we have to hear. And then we believe that Lord, that Jesus is the Lord. Then we repent. Then we confess that he is Lord with our mouth. And we believe that God raised him from the dead. Then, after that, we have to be baptized, as we see in Acts 22 and verse 16. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So we, believe, we hear, we believe in Jesus. We repent of our sins, we confess them with our mouth, and finally we are baptized for our sins. But there's something else. We have to continue to be faithful to him, and we have to continue living our lives under his authority, as we've seen here. Revelations chapter 2 and verse 10. Do not fear what some of you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, 
that you may be tested, and for ten days you'll have tribulation. That's talking to a church that he's writing to in, to, uh, in Revelation. But then we see, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And that applies to all of us. After we've followed all these steps, after we've been saved, we have to continue to follow his authority and be faithful to him. Otherwise, we'll receive the punishment that we saw earlier, which is being cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And if we are faithful to him, we'll get the crown of life, as we see here, and we'll be accepted into eternal life with him. So tonight, if you've fallen away from God's word, and if you haven't been faithful to him and you haven't been living as you should, we will pray for you. Please come to us that we can talk to you and bring you back and take you back into God's word. And if you haven't become a Christian, if you haven't done what he has asked us to do to be saved and what he's told us to do, and if you're not falling under his word, please come and be saved so that we be baptized. We have water right here that we can so that you can be saved and that you won't be cast into that lake before it's too late. If there's anything that we can do for you, please come as we stand and as we sing.